De Profundis by Oscar Wilde, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. De Profundis by Oscar Wilde, Part Two. And if life be, as it surely is, a problem to me, I am no less a problem to life. People must adopt some attitude towards me, and so pass judgment both on themselves and me. I need not say I am not talking of particular individuals. The only people I would care to be with now are artists and people who have suffered, those who know what beauty is, and those who know what sorrow is. Nobody else interests me. Nor am I making any demands on life. In all that I have said, I am simply concerned with my own mental attitude towards life as a whole, and I feel that not to be ashamed of having been punished is one of the first points I must attain to for the sake of my own perfection, and because I am so imperfect. Then I must learn how to be happy. Once I knew it, or thought I knew it by instinct. It was always springtime once in my heart. My temperament was akin to joy. I filled my life to the very brim with pleasure, as one might fill a cup to the very brim with wine. Now I am approaching life from a completely new standpoint, and even to conceive happiness is often extremely difficult for me. I remember during my first term at Oxford, reading in Pater's Renaissance, that book which has had such strange influence over my life, how Dante places low in the inferno those who willfully live in sadness and going to the college library and turning to the passage in the Divine Comedy, where beneath the dreary marsh lie those who were sullen in the sweet air, saying forever and ever through their sighs, Triste fumo nella dolce che dolla I knew the church condemned acedia, but the whole idea seemed to me quite fantastic, just the sort of sin I fancied a priest who knew nothing about real life would invent. Nor could I understand how Dante, who says that sorrow remarries us to God, could have been so harsh to those who were enamored of melancholy, if any such there really were. I had no idea that some day this would become to me one of the greatest temptations of my life. While I was in Wandsworth Prison, I longed to die. It was my one desire. Then after two months in the infirmary, I was transferred here and found myself growing gradually better in physical health. I was filled with rage. I determined to commit suicide on the very day on which I left prison. After a time, that evil mood passed away, and I made up my mind to live, but to wear gloom as a king wears purple, never to smile again, to turn whatever house I entered into a house of mourning, to make my friends walk slowly in sadness with me, to teach them that melancholy is the true secret of life, to maim them with an alien sorrow, to mar them with my own pain." Now I feel quite differently. I see it would be both ungrateful and unkind of me to pull so long a face that when my friends came to see me they would have to make their faces still longer in order to show their sympathy, or if I desired to entertain them, to invite them to sit down silently to bitter herbs and funeral baked meats. I must learn how to be cheerful and happy. The last two occasions on which I was allowed to see my friends here, I tried to be as cheerful as possible, and to show my cheerfulness in order to make them some slight return for their trouble in coming all the way from town to see me. It is only a slight return, I know, but it is the one I feel certain that pleases them most. I saw R for an hour on Saturday week, and I tried to give the fullest possible expression of the delight I really felt at our meeting and that, in the views and ideas I am here shaping for myself, I am quite right is shown to me by the fact that now, for the first time since my imprisonment, I have a real desire for life. There is before me so much to do, that I would regard it as a terrible tragedy if I died before I was allowed to complete, at any rate, a little of it. I see new developments in art, 
and life, each one of which is a fresh mode of perfection. I long to live so that I can explore what is no less than a new world to me. Do you want to know what this new world is? I think you can guess what it is. It is the world in which I have been living. Sorrow, then, and all that it teaches one, is my new world. I used to live entirely for pleasure. I shunned suffering and sorrow of every kind. I hated both. I resolved to ignore them as far as possible, to treat them, that is to say, as modes of imperfection. They were not part of my scheme of life. They had no place in my philosophy. My mother, who knew life as a whole, used often to quote to me Goethe's lines written by Carlyle in a book he had given her years ago and translated by him, I fancy, also who never ate his bread in sorrow, who never spent the midnight hours weeping and waiting for the morrow, he knows you not, ye heavenly powers. There were the lines which that noble queen of Prussia, whom Napoleon treated with such coarse brutality, used to quote in her humiliation and exile. There were the lines my mother often quoted in the troubles of her later life. I absolutely declined to accept or admit the enormous truth hidden in them. I could not understand it. I remember quite well how I used to tell her that I did not want to eat my bread in sorrow or to pass any night weeping and watching for a more bitter dawn. I had no idea that it was one of the special things that the fates had in store for me, that for a whole year of my life, indeed, I was to do little else. But so has my portion been meted out to me, and during the last few months I have, after terrible difficulties and struggles, been able to comprehend some of the lessons hidden in the heart of pain. Clergymen and people who use phrases without wisdom sometimes talk of suffering as a mystery. It is really a revelation. One discerns things one never discerned before. One approaches the whole of history from a different standpoint. What one had felt dimly through instinct about art is intellectually and emotionally realized with perfect clearness of vision and absolute intensity of apprehension. I now see that sorrow, being the supreme emotion of which man is capable, is at once the type and test of all great art. What the artist is always looking for is the mode of existence in which soul and body are one and indivisible in which the outward is expressive of the inward, in which form reveals. Of such modes of existence, there are not a few. Youth and the arts preoccupied with youth may serve as a model for us at one moment. At another, we may like to think that in its subtlety and sensitiveness of impression, its suggestion of a spirit dwelling in external things and making its raiment of earth and air, of mist and city alike, and in its morbid sympathy of its moods and tones and colors, modern landscape art is realizing for us pictorially what was realized in such plastic perfection by the Greeks. Music, in which all subject is absorbed in expression and cannot be separated from it, is a complex example, and a flower or a child a simple example of what I mean, but sorrow is the ultimate type of both in life and art. Behind joy and laughter, there may be a temperament coarse, hard, and callous. But behind sorrow, there is always sorrow. Pain, unlike pleasure, wears no mask. Truth in art is not any correspondence between the essential idea and the accidental existence. It is not the resemblance of shape to shadow, or of the form mirrored in the crystal to the form itself. It is no echo coming from a hollow hill any more than it is a silver well of water in the valley that shows the moon to the moon and Narcissus to Narcissus. Truth in art is the unity of a thing with itself, the outward rendered expressive of the inward, the soul made incarnate, the body instinct with spirit. For this reason, there is no truth comparable to sorrow. There are times when sorrow seems to me to be the only truth. Other things may be illusions of the eye or of the appetite, 
made to blind the one and cloy the other, but out of sorrow have the worlds been built, and at the birth of a child or a star there is pain. More than this, there is about sorrow an intense and extraordinary reality. I have said of myself that I was one who stood in symbolic relations to the art and culture of my age. There is not a single wretched man in this wretched place along with me who does not stand in symbolic relation to the very secret of life. For the secret of life is suffering. It is what is hidden behind everything. When we begin to live, what is sweet is so sweet to us and what is bitter so bitter that we inevitably direct all our desires toward pleasures and seek not merely for a month or twain to feed on honeycomb but for all our years to taste no other food ignorant all the while that we may really be starving the soul I remember talking once on this subject to one of the most beautiful personalities I have ever known, a woman whose sympathy and noble kindness to me, both before and since the tragedy of my imprisonment, have been beyond power and description, one who has really assisted me, though she does not know it, to bear the burden of my troubles more than anyone else in the whole world has, and all through the mere fact of her existence, through her being what she is partly an ideal and partly an influence, a suggestion of what one might become as well as a real help towards becoming it, a soul that renders the common air sweet and makes what is spiritual seem as simple and natural as sunlight or the sea, one for whom beauty and sorrow walk hand in hand and have the same message. On the occasion of which I am thinking, I recall distinctly how I said to her that there is enough suffering in one narrow London lane to show that God did not love man, and that wherever there was any sorrow, though but that of a child in some little garden weeping over a fault that it had or had not committed, the whole face of creation was completely marred. I was entirely wrong. She told me so, but I could not believe her. I was not in a sphere in which such belief was to be attained to. Now it seems to me that love of some kind is the only possible explanation of the extraordinary amount of suffering that there is in the world. I cannot conceive of any other explanation. I am convinced that there is no other, and that if the world has indeed, as I have said, been built on sorrow, it has been built by the hands of love, because in no other way could the soul of man, for whom the world was re made, reach the full stature of its perfection. Pleasure for the beautiful body, but pain for the beautiful soul. When I say that I am convinced of these things, I speak with too much pride. Far off, like a perfect pearl, one can see the city of God. It is so wonderful that it, it, it seems as if a child could reach it in a summer's day, and so a child could. But with me, and such as me, it is different. One can realize a thing in a single moment, but one loses it in the long hours that follow with leaden feet. It is so difficult to keep heights that the soul is competent to gain. We think in eternity, but we move slowly through time, and how slowly time goes with us who lie in prison, I need not tell again, nor of the weariness and despair that creep back into one cell and into the cell of one's heart, with such strange insistence that one has as it were, to garnish and sweep one's house for their coming, as for an unwelcome guest, or a bitter master, or a slave, whose slave it is one's chance or choice to be. And though at present my friends may find it a hard thing to believe, it is true nonetheless that for them living in freedom and idleness and comfort, it is more easy to learn the lessons of humility than it is for me who begin the day by going down on my knees and washing the floor of my cell. For prison life, with its endless privations and restrictions, makes one rebellious. The most terrible thing about it is not that it breaks one's heart, hearts are made to be broken, but that it turns one's heart to stone. 
one sometimes feels that it is only with a front of brass and lip of scorn that one can get through the day at all. And he who is in a state of rebellion cannot receive grace, to use the phrase of which the church is so fond, so rightly fond, I dare say. For in life, as in art, the mood of rebellion closes up the channels of the soul and shuts out the airs of heaven. Yet I must learn these lessons here, if I am to learn them anywhere, and must be filled with joy if my feet are on the right road and my face set towards the gate which is called beautiful, though I may fall many times in the mire and often in the mist go astray. This new life, as through my love of Dante I like sometimes to call it, is of course no new life at all, but simply the continuance, by means of development and evolution, of my formal life. I remember when I was at Oxford saying to one of my friends, as we were strolling round Magdalene's narrow bird-haunted walks one morning in the year before I took my degree, that I wanted to eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden of the world, and that I was going out into the world with that passion in my soul. And so, indeed, I went out, and so I lived. My own mistake was that I confined myself so exclusively to the trees of what seemed to me the sunlit side of the garden, and shunned the other side for its shadow and its gloom. Failure, disgrace, poverty, sorrow, despair, suffering, tears even, the broken words that come from lips in pain, remorse that makes one walk on thorns, conscience that condemns, self-abasement that punishes, the misery that puts ashes on its head, the anguish that chooses sackcloth for its raiment, and into its own drink puts gall. All these were things of which I was afraid. And as I had determined to know nothing of them, I was forced to taste each of them in turn, to feed on them, to have for a season, indeed, no other food at all. I don't forget for a single moment having lived for pleasure. I did it to the full, as one should do everything that one does. There was no pleasure I did not experience. I threw the pearl of my soul into a cup of wine. I went down the primrose path to the sound of flutes. I lived on honeycomb. But to have continued the same life would have been wrong because it would have been limiting. I had to pass on. The other half of the garden had its secrets for me also. Of course, all this is foreshadowed and prefigured in my books. Some of it is in The Happy Prince, some of it in The Young King, notably in the passage where the bishop says to the kneeling boy, Is not he who made misery wiser than thou art? A phrase which, when I wrote it, seemed to me little more than a phrase, a great deal of it, is hidden away in the note of doom that, like a purple thread, runs through the texture of Dorian Gray. In the critic, as artist, it is set forth in many colors. In the soul of man, it is written down and letters too easy to read. It is one of the refrains whose reoccurring motifs make Salome so like a piece of music and bind it together as a ballad. In the prose poem of the man who from the bronze of the image of the pleasures that liveth for a moment has to make the image of the sorrow that abideth forever, it is incarnate. It could not have been otherwise. At every single moment of one's life, one is what one is going to be, no less than what one has been. Art is a symbol, because man is a symbol. It is, if I can fully attain to it, the ultimate realization of the artistic life. For the artistic life is simply self-development. Humility in the artist is his frank acceptance of all experiences, just as love in the artist is simply the sense of beauty that reveals to the world its body and its soul. In Marius the Epicurean, Peter seeks to reconcile the artistic life with the life of religion in the deep, sweet, and austere sense of the word. 
but Marius is little more than a spectator, an ideal spectator indeed, and one to whom it is given to contemplate the spectacle of life with appropriate emotions, which Wordsworth defines as the poet's true aim, yet a spectator merely and perhaps a little too much occupied with the comeliness of the benches of the sanctuary to notice that it is the sanctuary of sorrow that he is gazing at. I see a far more intimate and immediate connection between the true life of Christ and the true life of the artist, and I take a keen pleasure in the reflection that long before sorrow had made my days her own and bound me to her wheel, I had written in The Soul of Man that he who would lead a Christ-like life must be entirely and absolutely himself, and had taken as my types not merely the shepherd on the hillside and the prisoner in his cell, but also the painter to whom the world is a pageant, and the poet for whom the world is a song. I remember saying once to André Gide, as we sat together in some Paris café, that while metaphysics had but little real interest for me, and morality absolutely none, there was nothing that either Plato or Christ had said that could not be transferred immediately into the sphere of art, and there find its complete fulfillment. Nor is it merely that we can discern in Christ that close union of personality with perfection which forms the real distinction between the classical and romantic movement in life, but the very basis of his nature was the same as that of the nature of the artist and intense and flame-like imagination. He realized in the entire sphere of human relations that imaginative sympathy, which in the sphere of art is the sole secret of creation. He understood the leprosy of the leper, the darkness of the blind, the fierce misery of those who live for pleasure, the strange poverty of the rich. Someone wrote to me in trouble. When you are not on your pedestal, you are not interesting. How remote was the writer from what Matthew Arnold calls the secret of Jesus? Either would have taught him that whatever happens to another happens to oneself, and if you want an inscription to read at dawn and at night time, and for pleasure or for pain, write up on the walls of your house in letters for the sun to gild and the moon to silver, whatever happens to oneself happens to another. Christ's place indeed is with the poets. His whole conception of humanity sprang right out of the imagination and can only be realized by it. What God was to the pantheist, man was to him. He was the first to conceive the divided races as a unity. Before his time there had been gods and men, and feeling through the mysticism of sympathy that in himself each had been made incarnate. He feels himself the son of the one, or the son of the other, according to his mood. More than anyone else in history, he wakes in us that temper of wonder to which romance always appeals. There is still something to me almost incredible in the idea of a young Galilean peasant imagining that he could bear on his own shoulders the burden of the entire world, all that had already been done and suffered, and all that was yet to be done and suffered, the sins of Nero, of Chesser Borgia, of Alexander the Sixth, and of him who was Emperor of Rome and Priest of the Sun, the sufferings of those whose names are legion and whose dwelling is among the tombs oppressed nationalities, factory children, thieves, people in prison, outcasts, those who are dumb under oppression and whose silence is heard only of God, and not merely imagining this, but actually achieving it so that at the present moment, all who come in contact with his personality, even though they may neither bow to his altar nor kneel before his priest, in some way find that the ugliness of their sin is taken away and the beauty of their sorrow revealed to them. I had said of Christ that he ranks with the poets. That is true. Shelley and Sophocles are of his company, but his entire life also is the most wonderful of poems. 
For pity and terror, there is nothing in the entire cycle of Greek tragedy to touch it. The absolute purity of the protagonist raises the entire scheme to a height of romantic art from which the sufferings of Thebes and Pelops's lines are by their very horror excluded, and shows how wrong Aristotle was when he said in his treatise on the drama that it would be impossible to bear the spectacle of one blameless in pain. Nor in Aeschylus nor Dante, those stern masters of tenderness, in Shakespeare the most purely human of all the great artists, in the whole of Celtic myth and legend, where the loveliness of the world is shown through a mist of tears, and the life of a man is no more than the life of a flower. Is there anything that, for sheer simplicity of pathos, wedded and made one with sublimity of tragic effect, can be said to equal or even approach the last act of Christ's passion? The Little Supper with His Companions, one of whom has already sold him for a price. The anguish in the quiet moonlit garden, the false friend coming close to him, as to betray him with a kiss the friend who still believed in him, and on whom, as on a rock, he had hoped to build a house of refuge for man, denying him, as the bird cried to the dawn, his own utter loneliness, his submission, his acceptance of everything, and along with it all such scenes as the high priest of orthodoxy rending his raiment in wrath, and the magistrate of civil justice calling for water in the vain hope of cleansing himself of that stain of innocent blood that makes him the scarlet figure of history. The coronation ceremony of sorrow, one of the most wonderful things in the whole of recorded time. The crucifixion of the innocent one before the eyes of his mother and of the disciple whom he loved. The soldiers gambling and throwing dice for his clothes. The terrible death by which he gave the world its most eternal symbol and his final burial in the tomb of the rich man, his body swathed in Egyptian linen with costly spices and perfumes as though he had been a king's son. When one contemplates all this from the point of view of art alone, one cannot but be grateful that the supreme office of the church should be the playing of the tragedy without the shedding of blood, the mystical presentation by means of dialogue and costume and gesture even of the passion of her Lord, and it is always a source of pleasure and awe to me to remember that the ultimate survival of the Greek chorus lost elsewhere to art is to be found in the servitor answering the priest at Mass. End of Part 2 This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.